Leonard Miladno, best-selling author of The Drunkard's Walk, has a new book called Subliminal, How Your Unconscious Mind Rules Behavior. A fascinating and enlightening look at the profound ways that the unconscious affects our experiences and our lives. Over the past two decades, researchers have developed remarkable new tools for probing the unconscious or subliminal workings of the mind. And this explosion of research has led to a sea change in our understanding of how the mind affects the way we live. With a new understanding of our own hidden mental processes that Milano provides in Subliminal, we're able to recognize and avoid some common pitfalls in our lives, work, and relationships. So with that, if you could welcome Leonard Milano to the stage. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for inviting me here and thanks for taking your lunch hour to listen to me and also to uh, participate in an experiment and do a little, little work on your lunch hour. I'm going to start actually with two experiments and it's totally voluntary and it's anonymous. So if you want to participate, just do what I ask and if you don't, then ignore me. So th the first thing I need to do is to divide you into two groups. And it's important uh, as we do the experiment that no one talk and you just follow the directions you'll see on the screen. So to divide you into two groups, let's go like right down here. And if you perceive that you're on this side of this line, then call yourself group one. And if you perceive that you're on this side, then you're group two. And group one, please look at the screen. Please read this silently and record your answer. Okay, now. Please read this question silently and also record your answer. Group one, please turn toward the back of the room. And group two, please turn forward. Group two, please read this question and record your answer. All right, now please read this question and record your answer here. Great, now you can all turn forward again, thank you. Now, if you're in group one, please put a one at the top of your slip of paper and circle it. And if you're in group two, put a two and circle that. Okay, now the second experiment. Uh, I need a female volunteer. Come up, please. Thank you. What's your name? Maria. Sorry? Maria. Maria, thank you. I'm going to read. Um, everyone study these words, okay? I guess you've, hopefully you've been studying them. I'm going to read uh, the, the top line. Maria is going to read the second line, and then I'll read the third line. Candy, sour, sugar, bitter, good. Taste, two. Oh, oh, sorry. Here, come. Taste. Oh, it's not. Hello. There we go. Taste, tooth, nice, honey, soda. Chocolate, heart, cake, eat, pie. Okay, I hope you're listening carefully. Thank you, Maria. All right, now you might be wondering, is there another test coming? Well, the answer is yes. But this isn't it. Whoops, hold on. Don't write anything, but I want you just to think of all the words of the list that you can recall and think of us saying them. Okay, just spend a minute and focus on that. All right, now, now comes the, the test. Okay, either uh, zero, one, two, or all three of these words were on the list. And I want you to think back, picture either Maria or I saying, or think back in your mind, if you can hear either Maria or I saying these words. If you're confident that one of these words is on the list, write it down. It might be that none of them were on the list, it might be that all three of them were on the list, or it might be that one or two of them were on the list. So I'm not telling you which or how many were on the list, but if any of them if you have a, a, if you're confident that you have a distinct memory of, of having seen one of these on the list or heard us saying them, please write it down right now. Okay? All right. Now, group one, please pass your papers this way. And group two, please pass your papers this way. And they'll be collected and tabulated for our experiment. Thank you. So while we're collecting the papers, let me begin to talk. So I call the book Subliminal. It's how your unconscious mind rules your behavior. Why did I call it subliminal? Well, some of you may know that in the 1950s, 
a marketing consultant named James Vickery said that he was able to subliminally influence people's behavior by flashing for just one thirtieth of a second a sign that says either drink Coca-Cola or eat popcorn during the, a movie uh, called Picnic in a new, that was playing in a New Jersey movie theater. And he claimed that he could increase the sales of popcorn by, I think it was 18% and Coke was 50, 51 or 55% by having these subliminal messages play in front of the audience, which they did not perceive. But about five years later, this is the, this is the 50th anniversary of, of, the, of an article in Advertising Age magazine in which he admitted that it was all a hoax. He had an, a failed marketing business and he was trying to prop it up with this trick. But although he'd admitted that it was a hoax, it never really left the American consciousness or our culture. And so subliminal persuasion is something that everyone even still recognizes today. Um, some people f follow this and, and didn't see, don't, don't seem to have gotten the retraction, though, uh, including one of our former presidents. This was an ad that George Bush ran against Al Gore in which he flashed, or his campaign flashed the word rats in the middle of a message uh, for one thirtieth of a second. And this message played on TV over an anti-Gore um, uh, ad. And it played for about 4,000 times before somebody discovered it, and then it was pulled from the air. So apparently they, they, they didn't really get the, get the message. But actually, a few years after this, a scientist decided to test to see whether such subliminal messages can actually have an effect on people. And they found that even a message such as this or other messages about drinks can have a little effect, a fragile effect, on people in the laboratory. For instance, in one experiment, they, people were brought into a room and told that they were going to see word scrambles. And unbeknownst to them, one of the, quote, word scrambles really said Lipton ice. And afterwards, the, the subjects were offered the drinks, and far more of them who had seen the Lipton Ice chose Lipton Ice Tea than, than, the, than those who hadn't seen it. But nobody really believes you can persuade someone to like Lipton Ice Tea if you don't like Lipton Ice Tea, or that that effect would last beyond the laboratory in, hours later. It's really something that's hard to reproduce in the lab, and it's very fragile, but it does exist. On the other hand, there are many subliminal effects in your environment that are affecting you all the time that are much less artificial than this. And that's really what the book is about. It's about subliminal effects, meaning effects that go on below the threshold of consciousness that, that your brain picks up, that your senses pick up, that are processed by the unconscious part of your brain and feed into your conscious perceptions, visual perceptions, social perceptions, memories, and they, they govern the way you behave to a great extent. Let me, before I talk about them and specifically, let me define what I mean by unconscious behavior. Okay, an unconscious process in your mind is something that is automatic and occurs with no effort on your part and it's outside of your awareness. You're not aware that it's happening or that it's influencing you and it's outside of your will and largely outside of your control. So those are the, are the traits that, that I uh, mean when I say something is unconscious. And as a result of that, we often don't understand what's influencing us in our everyday lives. And, I, and however, I want to point out that the unconscious I'm talking about is not the Freudian unconscious that, that you may have heard a lot about. It's, it's not the unconscious that was talked about for most of the 20th century. This is a totally different kind of unconscious. The Freudian unconscious was very emotional and it was hidden from people for motivational reasons. But the new unconscious that neuroscientists and psychologists talk about is far different from that. It's not accessible through therapy or talking or introspection but it takes place in parts of your brain that are inherently inaccessible to your conscious mind. So even though Freud was right that a lot of your behavior is influenced by the unconscious, most of the specifics of what he talked about have not found any support in the scientific community. My book Subliminal is based on something called social neuroscience. And social neuroscience, this slide says it evolved in the mid-1990s, but actually the technology that, that, that largely fueled it evolved in the 1990s, but the subject didn't really gel until the early 2000s. The first meeting in this field was in 2001. And it's a, the field is really a menage a trois. That's represented by this slide, those three pairs of feet. And the feet over on this side represents social psychology. Social psychology is the psychology of how people interact with each other, the psychology of our social interactions. The feet on this side is cognitive psychology. Cognitive psychology is the psychology of the way we think and the way we deliberate. And the feet in the center that brought them both together is neuroscience. 
And neuroscience really exploded in the mid-1990s when something called functional magnetic resonance imaging was, it was, uh, became widely available. And before that, fields of psychology did behavioral studies, but it was hard to get a, a good impression or a good idea, a concrete idea of exactly what was going on because we couldn't see into people's heads. And functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, allows scientists in a way to see into people's heads because it provides a 3D picture, not only of the structure of the brain, but of what parts of the brain are currently active, as you can see here by the yellow and the red, and the red areas. And so it allowed scientists not only to make speculations about, un, about behavior being unconscious, but to trace what parts of the brain are responsible for conscious and unconscious behavior and how they interact with each other. And one of my favorite studies along these lines, just to show you how powerful it's becoming, was done by a fellow named Jack Gallant, who is at Berkeley nearby. And he showed people a series of images, which are pictured here. There are many more of them, but here's four of them. And he used the data solely, da data solely from the functional magnetic resonance imaging data to predict what the people were looking at. So he didn't he, 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 didn't look, he didn't use any of the data about what images are actually being shown, but just readings of these people's brains, and he used that to choose images and make guesses. The computer chose images and made guesses as to what they were looking at. The computer had a, a database of six million images to choose from, and after taking these readings as input, it, it spat out what it thought uh, was its, its version of mind reading. So let's see how, how well it did. So I think that's pretty impressive. You can see on, on, on this side, these black slides here show you what the, the computers guess and the red slides are what the people were actually looking at. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how this works, how the unconscious mind works in your life. First I'm going to talk about the unconscious and sensory perception because that's very easy to illustrate and it's something that I can show you visually here as opposed to bringing people up and doing little experiments on you. But I did do two experiments to start the talk, so eventually we'll go and we'll demonstrate how that works in your own lives. But first let's look at how it works in vision and hearing and a lot of the processes that your brains use have their analogs in the way we construct our world, in, in our social world. I want you to come away with three main points. One is that our mental processes proceed along two paths, the conscious and the unconscious, which we're unaware of. Secondly, that all of our perceptions, our visual perceptions, our auditory perceptions, our memories, and our social perceptions, including the way you see people and the way you see yourself, are not just purely direct reflections of the data that you take in, but are constructions by your brain that seem real, but really are made of the data that you've, that you've assimilated, plus things like your prior beliefs, your knowledge, the context, and even your desires. And I want you to see that the way we experience the world, therefore, is largely due to this unconscious processing. Let's start with, let's start with a little picture here. Okay? I want the men especially to look at this picture and to look for something unusual in this picture. Okay? All right, so take your conscious mind. I want you to consciously search for something unusual in this picture. All right? Okay. Now that, that picture was, had something in the foreground that psychologists would call a high interest image. Okay? <laughs> That's why I said especially the men in the audience, because it's a higher interest image for men. And how many of you saw something very unusual in the picture? So, okay, a handful. How many of you didn't? Okay, a slightly larger handful. But Normally it breaks about one to four or one to three. Those, uh, the minority see something unusual and the majority don't. And that's because when light impinges on your retina, your brain doesn't automatically detect the image and make an image for you, but you have something called attention that has to be directed in order for you to, to see what your, what your, uh, in order for you consciously perceive what your eyes are seeing. And this attention is a function of both your conscious and your unconscious. And in the case of a very high interest image, your unconscious often wins and, and, and has that image dominate so that you don't really see the, uh, the lower interest part of the image. In this case, I'll tell you, unfortunately this is not the best projector, but uh, do you see a King Kong there in the background? If you look at that screen behind you, or at least those of you in the front, it's a lot clearer, I think. To your right, to the right of the woman, if you, as you're looking at her, 
in the bushes is the face of King Kong. Can you see it now? Oh, on my screen, that's perfect. But um, if you look on that screen back there, it's, I think it's uh, much more. It's over to the right. So I'll show you. It's right here. Do you see it now? It can be hard to see even if you're looking for it. But right here is the face of King Kong. There's also a ladder there that's, much, that, that, that's in much more contrast, that's right. All right, let me show you what you, when you look at, here's an example of, of a scene that you perceive if you look at the road, okay? Now this is, this is the image that your eye, this is the image that your conscious mind perceives when you look at the road. Let me show you now the image that your retina picks up, okay? Your retina picks up an image that's only clear in the very center of, of, the, of the area that you're fixating on. And it's very fuzzy outside of that. And it has a black spot that you'll see over here, which is, a, which is the blind spot from where your optic nerve attaches uh, to your retina. What your brain does is it takes this and it uses this data, and it uses the data from both eyes, and it fills in the gaps, and it uses the context that you're looking at, and it uses your, even your expectations and your desires to present to you a clear image and a three-dimensional image, which is not really there. And you perceive the image, you, when you look down the road, you perceive the image as being real. You don't have to expend any effort to, to see the clear image, it comes automatically. And you can't, in fact, if you look at an image of the road, you can't override these unconscious processes and see it the way it really impinges on your retina. Because all these things are happening for you automatically. Nature has uh, created human beings to work this way because this is how we survived in the wild. If we had to stop, and take the actual poor data that's coming to our eyes and work to reconstruct it, we would never be able to catch our prey or run from our predators. This is an example of how that works. If you look at the squares, you'll see the square A and you'll see the square B. Now the square, the square that's labeled B, you perceive as a white square and you perceive the square that's labeled A as a black square. This is because you're looking at it, you know you're looking at a checkerboard and you see the shadow from the cylinder and your eye puts all that together. But this is not the reality. The reality is that the square A is identical to the square B. It's not the same color, it's not any darker or lighter, it's exactly the same. So I want you to stare at it and override your unconscious mind and see it as being the same. Okay? You see it as being different because of the context, but actually it's the same. Now here's a couple people who are trying to blot it out with their hands, and that's the right way to do it. But let me do it electronically for you, it's a little bit easier. I'm gonna move the checkerboard away from the squares, and once I move the context away, you'll see that the squares are the same color. There you go. So what your unconscious mind is doing is it's creating the reality for you. It's creating the reality of this checkerboard because it's useful for you to see it that way, but it's overriding the actual physical data that a physicist would say is impinging on your, on, your, on your retinas. So you recognize this fellow? Your brain has a very special area called the fusiform face area that's used to analyze faces. That's because human beings are an extremely social species. We, we've, been, we've evolved to have the most complex social interactions of any other, of any other animal. And our brains and our unconscious minds have also evolved to handle that. So not only does your unconscious handle physical sensory perception for you, it handles a lot of your social perception. So your, the fusiform face area helps you recognize people because in human society, especially as we were evolving, it was very important to know who's dominant, who's not, who's an ally, who's an enemy, and how we all relate to each other. And so we, we've evolved these special talents for the social world and our unconscious mind builds us a picture of the social world just as it does of the physical world. The thing about your fusiform face area is though you don't usually see people upside down. And so it doesn't really work as well upside down as it does right side up. So when you look at these pictures, they probably both look like they're pretty decent pictures of the president. Does any one of them look grotesquely distorted to you? Oh, let's turn, how many of you have seen this before? Yeah, okay, that's why I shouldn't give this talk at Google, but let's turn them over for you. So this is the way, this is the, the actual pictures, and now your fusiform area, face area, seeing a, up, a right side up face kicks in, and they look grotesquely distorted. But it's hard to see when they're upside down. You can see the image go away as I turn the picture. Here's another example. Uh, the, look at the image on your left. 
Male or female? Female. Female. And the one on the right? Male. Okay, but they're actually the same person. Not only are they the same person, they are the same image, except that one has been doctored to show more contrast and one to have less contrast. So you're automatically perceiving the person as a male or a female based on certain cues that you're used to from everyday life. And this happens unconsciously and outside of your control or and it doesn't take any effort. So the moral of all these slides is that our vision is not objective, but rather it's constructed by our minds employing context, prior knowledge, belief, desire, and other such factors that are separate from the actual data that comes into your eyes. The same thing happens in hearing. So I'm going to just briefly give you a couple examples in hearing, and I want you to see how they are analogous to the same thing that's happened in vision. The set, I'm, going to have, I'm going to play this sentence for you in a minute where a cough obliterates one of the sounds. The sentence is, the state governors met with their respective legislatures convening in a capital city. Okay, now I want you to listen very carefully to this audio file. And just as I showed you the fuzzy picture of the roadside and, and, and told you how your brain fills it in to make it a clear picture, your brain is also going to fill in the sound that's obliterated by this cough and you're going to hear a pretty normal sentence. The state governors met with their respective legislatures convening in the capital city. The state governors met with their respective legislatures convening in the capital city. The state governors met with their respective legislatures convening in the capital city. The state governors met with their respective legislatures convening in the capital city. Okay, do you know what song was obliterated? G. Hmm? It's hard, huh? I mean, it sounds as it sounds somewhere like it's in the word maybe legislatures. Well, it is in the word legislatures and it's the first, oh, I guess I pushed the button a little too fast. The answer's up there. Now it's really astounding that more hands didn't go up. <laughs> it's the first S in the sound uh, in the word legislature. So let me play it for you again and try and hear that. The state governors met with their respective legislatures convening in the capital city. The state governors met with their respective legislatures convening in the capital city. The state governors met with their respective legislatures. So the reason that it's the reason that it's very hard or even impossible to tell exactly where that, that cough comes is that your brain fills it in. If, if you didn't speak English and you heard this, you would hear legislators, legislators, and not the word legislators, because you wouldn't know to fill it in. But because we speak English and you hear this, your brain fills it in just like it fills in the, the visual data. And there's a very famous experiment in the 1970s that shows how far your brain goes and how it uses context to fill it in. They played a similar uh, audio file with the word <coughs> eel. And the context at the end of the sentence that people were listening to defined, gave, gave their brains the, uh, the context for what word was being said. And when they played this for subjects, and they didn't tell them, again, what was being obliterated, and they asked them what they heard, the subjects who heard, it was found that the cough eel was on the orange, reported hearing the sentence, it was found that the peel was on the orange. And they didn't even notice that the cough obliterated the pee and peel, they just automatically heard peel. When the, the last word was shoe, they heard heel, and so on. So your brain uses the context, just like it did in the checkerboard, with the two squares that, didn't, that, that you thought didn't match but did, it uses context to create the reality for you. So speaking of context, let me show you how hard it is to overcome that context. I, uh, I'm going to play uh, a song for you, part of a song for you, called Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin. Okay, so listen to it. Now, now that you've heard it forwards, I'm going to play it backwards, okay? And um, I want you to listen to it backwards and see if it makes any sense. Uh, I don't think the words forward made a lot of sense. <laughs> and I don't think, <laughs> that's just me perhaps, I don't think the Led Zeppelin 
uh, was clever enough to, to, do, to design a song that makes sense both forward and backwards, but some people claim that, that it does. I don't know, how many of you have, have heard about these backwards effects? So, all right. Uh, so, so this is something that, that uh, has become, for a while, was quite popular on the web, looking for, for messages and backwards uh, songs and speeches by politicians, etc. So I'm going to play this for you, what you just heard backwards. And I want you to listen carefully and see if you can decipher the, uh, the, whatever the paragraph of words that constitute the backwards song. Now, not those of you who know this, but those of you who don't know this, did you make sense of it? It sounded like gibberish? It, it, yeah, it sounded like gibberish to me when I first heard it too. And then I was shocked, shocked to find this message in it. Let me show you. I'm going to play it for you now with the words of the backward message. Okay, and, and listen to it and read along and see if it makes sense to you this time. Okay, this is an example of, I'm going to give you some context for your brain to reconstruct the reality of the backward song. So from your laughter, I, I, I infer that you, you got it this time. So that probably sounded pretty real to you. Now, now you've heard the same sounds twice. Once it sounded like gibberish, and once it sounded perfectly real. So which, what's, which was reality? Is it, is it the second time that, where there was a satanic message, or was it the first time? Well, I'm going to play it for you another time now, and I, I, I want you to decide consciously. I want you to override your con unconscious mind. Watch the words, listen to the song, but don't connect the words with the song this time, okay? I want you to hear it the first way, even though you're seeing the words, okay? So were you able to overcome your unconscious mind? Did you, could you watch the words and hear it yet as gibberish? No, huh? All right, I'll give you one more chance, but this time I, I'm guessing that you're spoiled, like, like I am, because I've heard it so many times now, I cannot, even without the words, I know the words. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna play it for you again without the words, and now I want you to hear it without the satanic message. So could you overcome it, or is it still sounding like the Satan song? Yeah. Well, um, so because people, because of this suggestibility in this context that makes your brain automatically interpret this, some people, once they're told that this is there and they don't realize what's going on, they really believe that there isn't a satanic message there. Because what else could it be? It, it does sound very real. And uh, I want to thank Michael Schirmer of the Skeptic Society for the backward song. You know the Skeptic Society? You should check it out, skeptics.com. And one of the things he does is go around debunking myths like this where people find satanic messages. You can take any backwards sounds, come up with words that sound similar to that, play it, and the same effect will happen because your mind is using that context to create the reality. 
So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about social perception because the point is that these same tricks that your mind uh, uh, uses in, in audio and visual perception, it also uses in social perception. And it's, it's, these are, are very useful. I don't, mean to be call, I don't mean to be talking about these only because of the illusions that they create. Uh, if, you, if you run into people that look like this, you don't want to have to always individually analyze what is their role, what is their job, what do they want from me, how do I interact with them. You want to be able to automatically, without thinking, without any effort, categorize them and, and interact with them in the, in the, as a bus driver. Or if you see policemen, you have to be able to interact with policemen without analyzing first what are they there for, what's their role, what's the gun mean. Okay? <laughs> Especially in New York. I gave this talk in New York and they all said, yeah, that's true. Uh, Captains of industry and politicians, we, 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 we all get limited data on these people. And then when we think about them, especially the politicians who are going to have to vote for or not vote for, we form a picture of their character and their personality. We form a, a, what's often a much clearer picture than we have any right to because the data that's coming into our minds is like the data at the side of the road. It's very fuzzy, but our minds are forming for us a clear picture. Sometimes that clear picture, like, our, uh, like the picture that we get from the side of the road, is accurate. And sometimes our clear picture is inaccurate, it's an illusion, like the optical illusions I showed you. And everybody that we meet in the world, your, your work colleagues, your, your acquaintances, your casual friends, is something like that. We get limited data on people and on social situations. We get limited data when we're going to make purchases, when we're thinking about business decisions. And, but, but we have a clearer picture than that data really supports. And we don't realize that, that, the, that the clear picture that we have is not completely justified but it's filled in by our unconscious minds and presented to us as, as reality. So let's talk about this a little bit in social behavior. We're going to talk about how your social perception is constructed by your mind. Since this is an election year, I thought it would be good to talk about a, a nice election study. When you, you might be a staunch Democrat or a staunch Republican, in which case you're probably going to vote one way or the other no matter what. But a good 20, 25, 30 percent of the population are what we call swing voters who are in any given election are undecided and what they think they're doing, what they intend to do is to judge the candidates based on the issues, based on their experience, based on how competent they are. But one of the things that they don't realize they're doing is they're, 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 they're judging people by data that's fed to them from their unconscious mind to fill in the blanks and one of the things that our unconscious mind feeds them is looks. When you look at candidates, you automatically judge competence by the person's face. And this shows you an example of how that works. This was a study done in, in uh, UC Irvine. These are not the actual pictures used from the study because the, paper that the, uh, the papers that were uh, written about it did not have the faces, so I, I'm illustrating with these faces. But what they did was they, they made flyers on supposedly real congressional races. So they told the subjects of the experiment that these are races outside of your district. But here's a political flyer that we made on these two candidates. And the flyer shows their parties, their, their stance on some of the issues, their experience, and a photograph. And they're asking people to pick who they thought was the better person for the, for the job. But they were people outside their district, so they were not expected to recognize them. But in reality, what they did was they, they, they picked one person as a, uh, to be the Democrat and one person to be the Republican. And then they had a Hollywood makeup artist and a professional photographer create two versions of photos of them for the flyers. And one version was designed to make them look less competent, and another version was designed to make them look more competent. Prior to this, they did a little pilot study where they studied exactly what features of a person would make them look more or less competent. And then they used what they learned to have these people design two versions of each candidate. And half the people saw uh, a, the Republican candidate in her more competent looking version and the Democrat in her less competent looking version. And the other half saw the Republican in the less competent looking version and the Democrat in the more competent looking version. And then they compared the vote that they would get to see what is a vote swing just based on the uh, degree of competence in your picture. And they found that when the Republican was more competent looking, the Republican got 56% of the vote. But when she was less competent looking, she only got 44%. So there was a vote swing there from 44 to 56, for 50, I'm sorry, 58%. There was a vote swing of 14%. So 14% of the vote changed based purely on the person's picture, whether it was a competent looking picture or a less competent looking picture. So I mentioned the skeptic society. If you guys are skeptical, you could say, well, they were told that this was a real election, but that they had nothing at stake. 
So this might happen in the laboratory, but does it happen in real life? And fortunately, a fellow at Princeton, a psychologist named Alexander Todorov, decided to see if this works in real life. So he did something very impressive. He looked at about 400 elections, gubernatorial, senatorial, congressional elections, and he gathered photos of the candidates and paired them. This was before the 2006 elections. And he wondered, if this effect is real, can I predict the outcome of the races by these, uh, by these pictures? So he had subjects come into the lab and look at the pictures as in pairs very briefly and just pick one. Which one looks more competent? And he had hundreds of subjects do this, and he gathered statistics on which of these candidates looked more competent. And then he created a prediction for the, all those races based not on political science, not on party, not on the issues, based purely on who looks more competent to the most people. So the question is, how successful do you think he would have been? Well, he was actually very successful. He got 70% of the races correct that way. So what this indicates, this correlation, is that something is going on that when we're judging people, we're factoring in something we don't think we're factoring, which is their appearance. Another thing that influences us in our social interactions a great deal is touch. This slide shows four different kinds of primates engaged in grooming activities. <laughs> now, the, the, except for the one in the center, uh, these primates spend a lot of time, an hour or two every day, doing this grooming, even though it only takes about 10 or 20 minutes to accomplish the physical purpose of the grooming. And that's because alliances and social, uh, social alliances are very important for all primates, including us. And by touching, we create bonding and we create trust. And so all, all primates create their social alliances largely through their touching and their, uh, through their, and their grooming. And the question is, what about people? Well, touch is also very important for people. And in fact, in the last few years, scientists have even discovered specialized nerves that are uh, mostly in your arms and your face that don't work very well for feeling what's there, where something is, but transmit the pleasantness of social touch to your brain. So they seem to be there purely for the bonding experience. And so the question is, how much of an effect is this? How much of your perception of a scene or of an interaction with someone is influenced by the touch element? Okay, we talked about the looks element, but now I'm going to talk about the touch element. And my favorite experiment here was done in France and involved a, a, a few handsome Frenchmen and some French, single French women. The, the, this fellow represents the handsome Frenchman. He, these guys were all uh, in their 20s and they were asked to stand on a street corner in a town in northern France and spend all day for a few days propositioning single women, single young women who walked by. And they were all instructed to say exactly the same thing. This is the translation of it. They basically say, hi, my name's Antoine. Uh, you're very pretty. Don't have time to talk now. Can I have your phone number? I'll call you later for a drink. But to half of the women they propositioned, they were told to give a very light half second or less touch on the shoulder or the elbow. And to the other half, they weren't. They were told not to do that. And the question was, what, what kind of effect does this have on their success rate? Well, it had a great effect. It doubled it. So 10% of the women agreed to the date if they didn't touch them, and 20% did with the touch. Again, going to the skeptic side, you could say, well, touch is actually more directly related to sex. Uh, what about other things? That, uh, what about the influence of touch in other social situations that aren't so directly related to the touching you might do later? And so one of the other experiments uh, was done on restaurants, actually two of them. In one of the experiments, they gathered a group of waiters and waitresses instead of the, single, uh, instead of the, the, the men, and they told them, when you deal with your customers, I want you somewhere during the interaction to give them a nice light touch for half of them, and for half don't. And we're going to keep track of your tips and see if touching them increases your tips. And sure enough, they found that the waitresses and waiters averaged 14.5% tips from the customers they didn't touch and 17% from the customers they did touch. They did a similar experiment on how many people take your recommendation when you recommend the special. And that went up from 40% to 60% with the touch. What about going to the blackboards? Okay, this, this, is, this is one of my uh, pet peeves on this study. They said, no one in a math class, and I've taught math classes, no one in a math class will want to go to the blackboard. So they tested the influence of touch on kids who want to go to the blackboard in a difficult statistics class, and the professors asked them to go and go to the blackboard and potentially be embarrassed. And only 9% who weren't touched went to the blackboard, but with this very subtle touch, 28% did. 
Doctors. Where are the doctors? The doctors have disappeared. Well, oh, that's okay. Agreeing to take a mall survey. 53% agreed to take, spend five minutes on a mall survey, and 76% agreed to take it if they were given a light touch. So this touch, and, oh, by the way, in, in most of these studies, the, the subjects were debriefed afterward, and one of the questions they were asked was, did you, did you notice being touched at any time? And most of them in, in the study said that they didn't even notice the touch. Okay, finally, I, I want to talk about when self provides the context. So sometimes the context in your social situation has to do with how it matters to you personally and your, your own self-image or your own worldview. This is Salvador Dali, and he famously said, every morning upon awakening, I experience a supreme pleasure, that of being Salvador Dali. And I ask myself, wonderstruck, what prodigious thing will he do today, this Salvador Dali? Now, he may sound like a pompous ass, but I like, I like this quote because this quote is what our unconscious mind wants us all to feel about ourselves. Okay, because the best chance of success we can have in life, if you're approaching some difficult problem at Google, or if you're approaching difficult graduate school or medical school, or difficult medical problems, chemotherapy, uh, starting a business on your own, it's a, you have a very big advantage if you, if you feel that you can overcome this and that you, you, that, and that you don't have a, perhaps a totally realistic view of what you're getting into. And your unconscious mind is very important in helping you see that. Let me just show you the results of that. What happens when you ask people how good they are at things? If you ask high school kids, are you above average? I don't know if any of you have high school kids, but you'll probably know that they're gonna say yes. And indeed, in a survey of three million high school kids, 100% of them said they were above average. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing they rounded up from 99.99. <laughs> but uh, what about the professors? Do the teachers have a better view? So professors were asked, is your work above average? Yes, only 94% of them thought so. And here's some doctors. What about your doctor? Your doctor is usually confident in your diagnoses, but in one study, doctors are 80, confident that they had diagnosed pneumonia correctly 80% of the time, and they're only right 20% of the time. Uh, one of the things your mind does when it gives you these overinflated views of yourself is it changes the way you treat incoming data, okay? This is called motivated reasoning. So if you're completely objective and you look at data, then you might judge the data by the methodology, you might judge the data by the, uh, the weight that that, particular, that that particular data should hold. In other words, is that factor that you're testing very important? But what your unconscious mind does is it adjusts the weight that you give to data and adjusts your, your view of the methodology in a way to tend to confirm your pre-existing beliefs and desires. So you, you, when you're looking at data, the human mind does not act as a scientist who's analyzing data objectively and drawing a conclusion, but your unconscious mind is more like a lawyer who looks at the conclusion that you want and adjusts the way that you look at the evidence to tend to, to support that conclusion. And it's very important that it's unconscious because if you try to consciously do it, you're too smart for that. You're gonna know that I'm, I'm just fooling myself. But your unconscious can fool you in a way that you're not aware of. And that's how these things happen. And another thing that your unconscious does is it adjusts your memory. Your memory, as we'll see later, is a construction, just like your vision is and your audio and your social perception. Your memory, what you remember are the broad strokes of things that happen, like, just like uh, you, you, your eyes pick up the broad strokes of the scene, but it's fuzzy and your, and your brain puts it together. Your memory picks, remembers the broad strokes of events that happen and then fills in the blanks so that you have a very clear memory and distinct memory. But that memory uses things like context in addition to data. Context, prior knowledge, beliefs, and desires. So if you ask, for instance, students four years out of college, what were your grades, you'll find an interesting effect. They tend to remember their A's pretty well and their lower grades less and less. In one study, scientists gathered together a bunch of kids who had graduated four years earlier, got them to sign off on their transcripts, got their transcripts so they could see what their grades were and the kids had no motive to lie and they asked them about their grades. Well, they remember their A's 89% of the time, 64% of their B's, 51% of their C's, and only 29% of their D's. So if you were in school, and I always tell my students, if you're getting bad grades, don't worry. In time, your grades will improve. <laughs> now, in business, what happens is, 
This can cause problems because CEOs, for instance, tend to overpay for companies because they look at other companies and they go, I'm a better CEO than that CEO. One of the problems is that CEO didn't know how to run the company. I can run it better and so they end up overpaying for the company. So our unconscious mind creates sincere beliefs and images of what's going on in the world but, and we believe them as being real but they're not necessarily based purely on data. This motivated reasoning it was illustrated nicely in a, in a study in Texas. They took subjects and half of the, the subjects were all given the, the data on a, on a case where an automobile crashed into a car, uh, crashed into a motorcycle, and the motorcyclist was suing the automobile driver. And they gave them all the, the transcript of the case and the data and they told half of them, you're going to take the part of the uh, motorcyclist and they told the other half, you're going to take the part of the automobile driver. And you're going to pair up and you negotiate your own form of the settlement, which was between zero and hundred thousand dollars. So they digested all this data and they got ready to negotiate and then, and then the experimenter said, oh wait a minute. Before you do that, take your hat off, your advocate's hat off, this is just a game after all, so forget the conflict of interest. I want you to guess what the real settlement was and if you can guess within $5,000, I'll give you a cash bonus. So it's in your financial interest to be objective here and to ignore any possible motivated reasoning that you had when you were digesting the data. So how do they, how do, they do? Well, the, the subjects who were told that they were going to take the motorcyclist part guessed on average that a fair settlement would be $40,000, but those who took the uh, driver's part guessed only $20,000. So they were unable to overcome, as I said, these are automatic, the unconscious effects are automatic and very hard to control. So even when money was at stake for them, they were unable to be objective in their analysis of the case. So let's see if this stuff happens to you. So we'll get to those two tests that we did earlier. And the first one is called anchoring. And it shows how the context uh, of a situation can affect your consumer behavior. Uh, you were both given, uh, both groups were given uh, this question as question number two. How much would you expect to pay for this lovely hotel room in Tahiti? Okay, well let me tell you what the answers were. Um, group one, that's you guys, right? You guessed on average $1,176. So group two, you're probably a little bit surprised because you guessed on average $304. Well, what did I do? I exercised mind control over you guys. From over here, I went like that and I got you guys to quadruple your offer, okay? And how did I do that? That's because when I didn't give you a lot of data on the hotel room. I gave you some pictures and it was in Tahiti and a little information. And your brain formed some kind of image of, this, of, of what this hotel room is worth. The thing is that the difference between you guys was the first question I asked. So group one was asked, does this cost more than $5,500 a night? And group two was asked, does this cost more than $55 a night? This is like a throwaway question because I think it's pretty obvious that it is more than $55 a night and it's not more than $5,500 a night. And you probably didn't think too much about it and thought, well, those, these questions are a little bit extreme. But yet it affected your conscious assessment of what's going on. So when you watch those late night shows and they're going, they're, they want to sell you 10 steak knives for $49.95 in the end, but they start off by saying, these 10 steak knives are worth $700. We normally sell them for $700, but today, just for you, it's discounted to $49.95. And you're probably thinking, if you're like me, that's $700, what BS, if no one would ever pay anything like that. But what you don't realize is they manipulated you to thinking that the $49.95 wasn't nearly as bad as you might think if they hadn't given you the $700 to begin with, as absurd as it is. So finally, let me, let me, uh, Let's go to the other test, which is shows you how you create your own memories. Okay, what I gave you earlier were these, was this list over here, candy, sour, sugar, etc. And then I asked you which of these words appeared on the list. Well, I was telling you how your brain constructs memories just like it constructs vision based on things like context. And this is a good illustration of that. Okay, because um, the word point was not on the list and only two of you guessed the word point. That's, that's a pretty good and that's normal. And the word taste was on the list and 37 of you rec correctly remember that the word taste was on the list. But then remember I asked you to only write it down if you're confident and if you can hear us, hear us saying the word. So I don't think any of you should have written down sweet because sweet wasn't on the list. So if you remember the word sweet, it was what we call a false memory. Your brain reconstructed that clear as a bell, excuse the pun, but it didn't hear anything. It's just the gist of the list and it filled it in for you. 
So I said 37 people said taste. Well, 37 people also said that sweet was on the list. So this shows you the power of the reconstruction of your memory, and it's something to be very cognitive of when you read about legal cases and eyewitness testimony, but we don't have time for that. So let me just end with a quote from Carl Jung that I like. I don't believe in a lot of what he said, but um, some, of, some of what he said was really prescient. These subliminal aspects of everything that happens to us may seem to play very little part in our daily lives, but they are the almost invisible roots of our unconscious thoughts. Thank you.